Hey ladies, well, have you ever made any of these statements? I'm just too busy. I never have time for anything. Maybe you don't say it like that. I say it like that. Um, I have too much on my plate. I just can't seem to get organized. Or I'm just not motivated, right? I think all of us have said that at one time or another, and these situations really happen all too often in our daily lives. And they can be a source of stress that causes us to take our eyes off of the Lord and put them on the current situation. It seems sometimes that it's just a problem of too much or not enough, right? Too much to do or too many commitments, not enough time or motivation. In reality, though, if we want to be unmovable in the area of time management, we need to understand what time is for. And the good news is that our God created time. So let's turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And we're going to read the first 11 verses. Ecclesiastes 3 starting in verse 1. It tells us, To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. I think that was COVID. A time to gain and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. What profit has the worker from that in which he labors. I have seen the God-given task with which the sons of men are to be occupied. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. God created us to live in time for a brief period and this life is actually a preparation for eternity. So how we spend our time directly correlates with our preparedness for heaven. In 1 Peter chapter 2, in verse 11, it says the following, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul. Although we live in time now, we're just pilgrims on this earth, sojourners passing through, and our eternal home awaits us in heaven with Jesus. We hold on so tightly um, to the things of this life when in reality, we're just sojourners and pilgrims passing through. Has anyone heard about the three T's? Three T's, no? Okay, I'll tell you what they are. It's time, talents and treasure yes good um the the way we use these things really say a lot about what we value in psalm 90 we learn from moses that time is a valuable resource so let's turn there and read psalm 90 verse 12. the word says so teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. The CSB translation says it like this. Teach us to number our days carefully so that we may develop wisdom in our hearts. I love that. The Hebrew word that is used in this passage for number, it means to a lot or to properly weigh out. To a lot or to properly weigh out. So if you know me, you know I really love coffee. I'm a coffee girl. And when I want to make a delicious cup of coffee, right, I get some good beans and a little scale, and I weigh out the proper amount, I allot the proper amount of beans 
for how many cups I'm gonna make, right? So if I put too many, it's gonna be bitter, it's not gonna taste good, but if I put too little, then what happens is like water. You Nobody wants hot water, that's gross. <laughs> so, right, so that's important, and that's what I think about when I read this verse, that um, when we manage our time, when we properly weigh out, number our days, then this verse tells us we will gain wisdom. And what's really interesting too is here the word wisdom, it means skill in war, that's interesting, or wisdom in administration. And these are both very valuable things to have in this life. Properly weighed out, our time will allow us to gain skill in war and wisdom in administration. Skill in war, if we really think about it, this life is a battle. The world is constantly coming against us with um, just bashing us, really, um, against the wonderful role that God has given us. And we really need skill in battle to safeguard our minds from this world's wrong messages. And we definitely need wisdom in directing our day-to-day -day activities. So our first point is that time is a valuable resource. Secondly, we're going to see that because time is so valuable, we must use it wisely. I want you guys to imagine that you are given each day $86,400. That's a lot of money. Um, you must use it all. You can't save any for the next day. How would you spend it? Would you use it wisely to pay your bills, to help others? Would you invest it? Would you waste it all on frivolous things? Each day we are given 86,400 seconds to spend. What are we doing with it? Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to read verses 15 through 17. Ephesians 5, 15 through 17 says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. The Enduring Word Commentary has this great explanation of redeeming the time. It says that there were two ancient Greek words used for time. One had the idea simply of day upon day and hour upon hour. The other had the idea of a definite portion of time, a time where something should happen. It is the difference between saying time and the time. The idea here in this verse is of the time. It is the definite season of opportunity that Christians must redeem. This word translated opportunity is the same word used in Galatians 6.10. You don't have to turn there. I'll, I'll read it for you. It says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So Paul isn't telling us here to make the most of every moment, even though that is good advice. Um, the Enduring Word Commentary continues. He says, he tells us to seize every opportunity for the glory of Jesus. It isn't to make the most of time, but to make the most of the time. So the idea behind redeeming the time is that you buy up opportunities like a shrewd businessman. You make the most of every opportunity for Jesus. And I love this verse because it confirms what we learned in Psalm 90, that time is valuable and should be properly allotted and not wasted. We are to use it like that shrewd business person to make the most of every opportunity for Christ for the things that have heavenly value and not for the things that will burn and be thrown away. Let's turn to Romans 14. I'm going to read one verse from there. Um, here we learn the third thing that we are learning is that how we spend our time matters to God. Romans 14, 12 tells us, 
so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. And this includes our time. If we think about that, that's a little sobering because you know why. So next we're going to read two passages that contrast two ladies that seem to be doing the same thing. One of them was admonished by Jesus and the other one was not. By the way, I wanted to put a little plug for Ladies Bible Study. This is a conversation we actually had in Ladies Bible Study. And it was so fitting for this theme of time management. So if you're not already plugged into Ladies Bible Study, just consider praying about joining us next mm -hmm. semester. So we're going to turn to a familiar um, passage. It's in Luke chapter 10. And we're going to see our favorite Bible sisters, Mary and Martha. They're so cute. <laughs> so we're going to read Luke 10, um, 38 through 42. It says, now it happened as they went that they entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her, tell her, to help me. <laughs> and Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. Okay, now keeping this in mind, I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 18. We're going to read verses 1 through 8. It says, Then the Lord appeared to him, and this is speaking of Abraham. The Lord appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Mamre, and he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your heart. After that, you may pass by in as much as you have come to your servant. They said, do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, quickly, make ready three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd to, uh, to, and took a tender and good calf and gave it to the young man, and he hastened to prepare it. So he took butter and milk and the calf, which he had prepared, and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree as they ate. So we see both Martha and Sarah were preparing a meal for guests, right? And But what we see here is that it's not necessarily about the thing we're doing, but about our heart while we're doing it. The scripture tells us that she was distracted, right? Martha was really focused on herself and on the amount of work that she had to do and that nobody was helping her. But what the scripture says, and it uses these words, she was distracted, she was worried, and she was troubled. Well, Sarah, she doesn't say any of that. It says she was focused on the role that the Lord gave her. In this case, it was to help her husband prepare a meal. He was helping too. Um, it's clear from Genesis 18 that one of those visitors who would be eating that meal was actually the Lord himself. What a privilege she had. Martha had the same privilege. She was preparing a meal for Jesus, but she was shaken, moved by her circumstance. She was burdened by the work as frequently happens to us when our hearts are worried and troubled and our eyes are not on the Lord. We want to be productive, but we go about it the wrong way. A simple Google search, right? Productivity, how to be productive. It's going to give us a lot of advice about productivity and how to get things done. The focus, however, is on being driven to accomplish many things. It's about quantity and feeling good about ourselves. In the world, productivity equals money, 
pleasing yourself and getting things done. But the biblical view of productivity is quite different. It's about pleasing God and serving Him. So, in the time that we have, we're going to talk about some practical do's and don'ts to help us use our time wisely. So the first thing we should do, the first do, is pray. This is the most important thing we can do. Giving our day to the Lord will prepare our hearts for what lies ahead. Psalm 31 verses 14 and 15 is a great prayer that we should pray. It says, But as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, You are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. What a great prayer to start your day like that. Ephesians 2.10 also says that God has prepared good works for us to walk in. So God has already prepared those for us. So prayer, really, what it does is it helps us to be sensitive to God's promptings and be led by the Spirit instead of being led by our own agenda. Pa Pastor Chuck Smith used to say, um, blessed are the flexible, right? Mm -hmm. And the Lord may want to change our plans to minister to a sister or maybe to a family member. Um, our hearts should be to be um, desiring to be led by the Lord as we go about our day. And maybe those interruptions are actually divine appointments where the Lord really wants to use us or maybe He wants to get our attention for some reason. So pray, step number one. The second thing we can do is plan. Right? Benjamin Franklin, we love him, he once said, if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail, right? And letting God be in charge of our day doesn't mean that we shouldn't plan either. The Bible encourages us to plan. Let's look at what Jesus said in Luke chapter 14. So we can turn there. We're going to read verses 28 to 30. And it says, oh, I'll wait for you. I hear you. I hear you turning. Okay. Chapter 14. So Luke 14, 28 to 30. It says, For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Proverbs 21, verse 5, another beautiful scripture about planning. It tells us, The plans of the diligent lead surely to plenty, but those of everyone who is hasty surely to poverty. And as we plan, you know, calendars are a great tool. Some of you really love your calendars. Um, when I was in college, I um, had a lot of anxiety just about all the assignments, right? They come, like, they just come at you. And if you don't plan, like, you're going to miss them. You're going to fall behind. Um, so what I would do is um, the, the first week of class, when you get all the syllabus, syllabi, Miss Alicia, from the professors, um, I would look at the assignments and I would like kind of estimate how long the assignments would take and when they were due and I had this cute little planner and I would just each day I'd be like okay I'm gonna spend two hours on this one an hour on this one I'm gonna read this chapter I just organize like my week like that and that way I just felt so like at peace because I didn't have to worry that I, anything was gonna get missed and then every day when I opened my planner, I just had to do what was in the square that's it. I don't have to think about it anymore. So no more, no less, just do this. And if I did that, then tomorrow I did the next thing. Then, I don't know, for me, it was like a great way of relieving stress. And so um, this is something that I continue to do, um, even at home for home projects and at work for work projects. So it's very practical. I also tried um, not to make it unreasonable, right? Because sometimes we get really aggressive and we want to put too much in there. And really what we're just doing is setting ourselves up to fail. 
and then that's uh, will spiral into this whole like I'm a failure thing and we don't want that either right I know in the world they talk about smart goals that they're like achievable and manageable and all these things but it, it's it's wise right to just know your limits too and do the things that you know that you're gonna be able to accomplish in a day and not go crazy so another girl I talked to you know I asked different girls like what do you do to help you stay organized and things another girl she puts the top three things her top three to do's on her planner each day and that helps her make sure that those three things get done like if nothing else gets done these are the three things that I want to do today so I thought that was also super helpful um, I did bring a planner to show you guys right so this is a beautiful planner and sometimes it's great inspiration to have a planner that is, you know, aesthetically beautiful, that has like verses. Um, so I, I brought it to show, right? And it's a great way to motivate us, to uh, encourage us to actually make those plans. So, yeah, super cute. I know a girl, if you like that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Okay, so when planning, it's important to distinguish between um, what needs to be done and what can wait for another time. That's also really important because not everything is urgent. So if you're like me, like I think everything is urgent. So if I can't do like 10 things at the same time, like I'm already like, like very stressed, right? So, but it, the truth is that not everything is urgent and we need to be able to make that distinction, work through your to-do list by doing the most important things first. Right? And don't be discouraged like Martha, our friend, we love her, uh, or troubled when inconveniences come up because they will, right? You know, the, like you have your kids like sleep trained and then one day they just do everything backwards. Like they just decided that they're not going to sleep or they're not going to eat or they're going to throw up on you. That's going to happen. And that's okay, you know, that's okay. Um, but um, maybe someone you were counting on at work didn't come in, or you're doing like a group project at school and it didn't go so well, and now you're stuck doing everything, like, it's okay. Um, remember in those moments that happen to stop and pray. We'll go back. And instead of getting upset or frustrated, the Lord is more than able to make up for any lost time since He invented time after all. So for those of us that love planning and productivity, we should remember that if we let it, productivity can become an idol. It really can. We don't have to go to everything, ladies. We just don't. FOMO should not direct our lives. We need to be in communion with the Lord and uh, follow His lead. Really, that's, that's the bottom line. Oswald Chambers says this in my almost for his highest. He says, don't plan without God. God seems to have a delightful way of upsetting the plans we have made when we have not taken him into account. We get ourselves into circumstances that were not chosen by God and suddenly we realize that we have been making our plans without him, that we have not even considered him to be a vital living factor in the planning of our lives. In spiritual issues, it is customary for us to put God first, but we tend to think that it is inappropriate and unnecessary to put him first in the practical, everyday issues of our lives. If we have the idea that we have to put our spiritual face before we can come near to God, then we will never come near to him. We must come as we are. I love that. Okay, one more verse on this topic. Let's turn to James chapter 4. James 4. 13 through 15. It says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a, vap a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. So it goes back to prayer and asking Jesus to make him and his kingdom our priority. So speaking of priority, the third thing we should do is prioritize. But what? Prioritize eternal things. Prioritize eternal things. 
we all have responsibilities that we need to attend to, right? Family, work, you know, ministry, whatever God has put in your life and those that's important. But time alone with God and time for fellowship with other believers are important for our spiritual growth. Therefore, we must not neglect giving time to these activities. Jesus was the one that set the example for us in Mark chapter 1. In Mark 1.35, we read this. It says, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. And I love how it says, a long while before daylight. What does that mean? Really early in the morning. <laughs> the Bible also says in, in Matthew 6.33, a familiar passage, it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Psalm 5, 1 through 3, encourages us to start each day with the Lord. Let's turn there. verse 1 says give ear to my words O Lord consider my meditation give heed to the voice of my cry my king and my God for to you I will pray my voice you shall hear in the morning O Lord in the morning I will direct it to you and I will look up so twice in these verses it emphasizes in the morning. And typically your brain is the sharpest in the morning. Typically. <laughs> Since you have like the largest store of energy at that time. So spending time alone with God is a great way to start each day. I realize that not everyone is a morning person. So, but whatever time that you can, please find that time during the day to commune with the Lord. The famous missionary Hudson Taylor, he wisely said this. I love it. It's like one of my favorite quotes. Do not have your concert first and then tune your instrument afterwards. <laughs> right? Begin the day with the word of God and prayer and get first of all into harmony with him. So fellowship with believers should also be important to us. Psalm 133 is a famous and very, um, you know, passage that we read a lot when it comes to fellowship it says how delightfully good and i'm reading a csb version how delightfully good when brothers live together in harmony it is like fine oil on the beard running down on the beard running down aaron's beard onto his robes it is like the dew of hermon falling on the mountains of zion for there the lord has appointed the blessing life forevermore so i just wanted to share some beautiful quotes that convey the importance and really it is a privilege, the privilege of fellowship. So John Trapp, he says, communion of the saints is the next happiness upon earth to communion with God. Adam Clark, he says, the odor of this must have been very agreeable and serves here as a metaphor to point out the exquisite excellence of brotherly love. And finally, Spurgeon. What a sacred thing must brotherly love be when it can be likened to an oil which must never be poured out on any man but on the Lord's high priest alone. Right? So, so fellowship is such a precious gift, we should value it. Right? Okay, number four. Another do. Put away worthless things. Put away worthless things. So I see some youth here. So you know this verse from our winter retreat, Psalm 119, verse 37. It says, Turn my eyes away from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. Mm -hmm. There are so many worthless things that we spend our time on. Mm -hmm. These are time wasters. Social media, <laughs> the internet, duh, can be a huge black hole when we... Uh, count how many hours like we waste on, on just scrolling through, right? Those ads, those quizzes, right? They get you. They always get you, right? <laughs> and they can take away time from more important things, honestly. So uh, what I want to say is that we don't always need to know what everybody's doing all the time. 
you just don't need to know that. And we don't need to show everybody what we're doing all the time. It, 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 many times these images just rob us of the contentment and they take away time that we can be giving to the Lord, to prayer, to communion, to fellowship with the brothers and sisters in the Lord, right? The things that really have eternal value. Another time waster, worry. How many hours have we spent worrying about something that didn't even happen? I'm, I'm like so guilty of that. I've heard it said, right, um, this famous quote, and I, I think it's so funny, that worry is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it gets you nowhere. Right? So in Hebrews chapter 12, we're going to read just the first two verses. Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that is set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So this verse talks about the runner, right? And the runner is really concerned with making his best time. So in order to do that, right, he dresses in a way that will allow him to run unencumbered. So this verse encourages us to just lay aside those weights. I was listening to Pastor Sandy Adams, and he defines weights as things that are not necessarily sinful, nothing evil per se, they just make it difficult to achieve our goal. Just like extra baggage, he said it like this, just like with his little southern accent, just like extra baggage, those weights drag us down. And so I, I kept thinking about that, and I was thinking that the most enjoyable trips uh, I like to travel too when I get an opportunity and the most enjoyable trips that I've taken are the ones where I pack the lightest, mm -hmm. right? No waiting in baggage claim, mm -hmm. no lost luggage, no dragging that large suitcase up the, the stairs when the elevator at the hotel was broken. <laughs> We've all done that, right? It's such a pain. <laughs> so, but the secret to being unshakable in our time management, ladies, is to lighten our load. Let's ask ourselves, what am I watching either on TV or on my phone? What activities or commitments are taking up my resources without pointing me or others to Jesus? I'm going to say that again. What am I watching either on TV or on my phone? What activities or commitments are taking up my resources without pointing me or others to Jesus? When I was uh, studying programming, I don't know why I went back to college for this. <laughs> I kept thinking of college examples. There was an acronym um, that we learned. It's a G-I-G-O. Does anybody know what that stands for? It stands for garbage in, garbage out, right? You've all heard that. So it doesn't matter how good your program was. Your programming could be perfect, but if you put in bad data, you were going to get bad results. There's no way around that. And so what's interesting is that Jesus came up with this way before the applied sciences came up with this. So we see that in Luke chapter 11, in verse 34. The Lord says here, um, as he was speaking, he says, the lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body is also full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body is also full of darkness. Therefore, take heed. And when Jesus says take heed, like, Take heed. <laughs> Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. We wonder why sometimes that we're tired all the time and our lives are ineffective for God's kingdom. Let's begin by putting away the weights and garbage from our lives. Instead, we should focus on eternal things. The things that are listed in Philippians 4, verse 8. Let's look at those. Again, I'm reading from Christian Standard Bible. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, 
whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence, and if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Again, that's Philippians 4, 8. And I love that, just the very first one. You don't even have to, like if you don't want to read the whole list, just whatever is true. A lot of times we just are thinking about things that are not even true. If it's not true, the Bible says don't think about it. It's just a time waster. The Lord is in control of our situations. He knows everything, as we heard Miss Carol share today. Okay, I have one don't, number five. This is the last do and don't. Don't procrastinate, right? Beware of the pitfall of procrastination. The Cambridge Dictionary defines procrastination as the act of delaying something that must be done. It says must be done. <laughs> So I found a recent 2023 study on procrastination, and these are some facts that the researchers found, and you may be surprised at some, not at others, but some you will be surprised. So uh, the first one says that 20 to 25% of people procrastinate chronically. 88% of workers procrastinate 60 or more minutes daily on the job. This was not a surprise. 80 to 95% of college students procrastinate to some degree. <laughs> sorry, sorry college students, we love you. 75% um, of people consider procrastination a personality trait or problem. I, I've said that, ah, oh, or you know, that's like my thing, I just, you know, people say that all the time. Um, and this one really was surprising. Procrastination costs the US economy an estimated 70 billion per year. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, that was surprising. Anyway, the book of Proverbs is filled with verses warning us against the pitfall of procrastination. So let's look at a few of those. We're going to go to Proverbs 6. Verses 10 and 11. It says... A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall your poverty come on you like a, like a prowler, and your need like an armed man. And then just a few pages over in Proverbs 12. Verse 24. It says, the hand of the diligent will rule, but the lazy man will be put to forced labor. Ouch. And we already read Proverbs 21.5, but I'll just read it quickly. It says, the plans of the diligent lead surely to plenty, but those of everyone who is hasty surely to poverty. So, ladies, if we long to be women who are fruitful and have fruitful lives for Christ, let's be careful to quickly identify procrastination and combat it by asking the Holy Spirit to give us diligence. As daughters of Christ, we can ask the Holy Spirit to make us faithful in the work of our hands. We know from Galatians chapter 5 that faithfulness is a gift of the Holy Spirit. So we can ask the Lord. We, we heard again today, Miss Carol shared that the Spirit is with us. He's ready to help us all the time. And so we can ask Him to help us grow in faithfulness. If we go back to Psalm 90, where we read earlier, there's another beautiful prayer that we can be praying in verses um, 16 to 17, it says, Let your work be seen by your servants, and let your splendor and your splendor by their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be on us. Establish for us the work of our hands. Establish the work of our hands. Amen. So as we review, right? We want to remember that God works in our lives, even through time management. He knows the tendencies of our flesh and uses each circumstance in our life to work on our heart issues, for sure. Instead of battling with the Lord, ladies, let's purpose to cooperate with His will for us. So we learned that He wants us to pray and allow Him by His Holy Spirit to guide our steps. We should plan with God's will as the goal and not allow the interruptions and inconveniences of the day to move us. We should prioritize eternal things, most importantly our time with Jesus each and every day. 
We should put away worthless things by getting rid of time wasters. And finally, we should be aware of the pitfall of procrastination, which makes us ineffective in accomplishing God's purpose for us. Ladies, the return of the Lord is closer every day. Every day. There's no sense in squandering our time on things that have no eternal purpose. If we desire to be unshakable and unmovable, we must set aside the worthless things that consume our time and use the precious resource of time to honor Jesus and point others to him. In Hebrews 3, 15, it tells us today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Let's give our hours to God and watch him do amazing things in our lives. As we close, I want to just take, give you guys a minute, right, just to think about um, maybe identifying one thing that you will do and maybe one or more time wasters that you will put away and just jot them down in your notes. And then um, I'll give us a few minutes to do that. And then with those things in mind, you know, we'll ask the Holy Spirit to help us to put feet to what we learned today. So just take a few minutes.